So how would we approach the book? Well, let's begin with the prologue. And uh, if you're willing, I'll read um, chapter 1, verse 1. And Brent, would you be really willing to read 2? And we'll just go straight round the room. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to ask you, uh, first of all, how would we preach this? Uh, and why would John begin like this? Okay? So some of you have preached on this prologue already. Um, let me just give you a couple of thoughts. I've put on the white sheet under this um, chapters 1 to 2, can you see that? And point C, which is the prologue. It seems to me, and you might like to come back on this, that this is a unique ladder-down gospel message. Uh, as we know, the world thinks up. Rationalism thinks up. Mysticism in the East thinks up. And the whole world is committed to this kind of ladder up thinking, as you probably know. So when you go to school, you try to climb the ladder of learning. When you go to work, you climb the corporate ladder. Uh, if you want to win trophies in the sport world, you have to go up the ladder of the grades. The world is very much a ladder up world. And as somebody has said, the Western world is large, marked largely by this kind of thinking up. And the Eastern world has been marked largely by this uh, experiencing up. And here, in this beautiful prologue, the Lord just completely decimates that and says, Christ came down. This is a ladder down. And when we're sharing the gospel with people, often this is one of the ways to share the gospel, isn't it? It's to say to a person, um, you know, so much religion is just ladder up stuff. So depressing. And here is the gospel of Christ, which is this helicopter down. So wonderful. And so this um, prologue, which is complex and rich and meaty, is also very, very special uh, in teaching the, the, the gospel down message of grace. So uh, we, we see in the text that um, although the world began in the beginning, we know that from Genesis, the word did not begin in the beginning. Uh, we see in these early verses that the word was God himself. And we need to remember too that when we're looking at this word, word, that it's probably got an Old Testament background, not so much a Greek background. Uh, the Greek world may have been interested in this language, but actually the word that John is using for word is very much an Old Testament background. So the word was God, and then we see stepping down a, a, a rung or two, he makes the world. Uh, it, it expresses something of himself, especially in its perfection, but he is, of course, distinct from it. And so we would escape many dangers by knowing that he made it, but also that he is separate from it. And then in verse 4, he talks um, with this very intriguing language that in him was life, we understand that, and the life was the light of men. In other words, the life is indispensable for seeing, understanding, knowing, and belonging. And then going down a ladder here, we see um, that John the Baptist is sent to prepare the coming of Christ, and this is miraculous. And then we see that the word himself comes, and he is both rejected astonishingly and received wonderfully. And then that he makes his tent among us in flesh. And to, to welcome him is to be welcomed by the Father. So there are these steps of, of the ladder. Now, I just quickly put down uh, off the cuff, because I can't remember when I preached on this, I just quickly put down a, an outline for a sermon. And you don't have to take any notice of this. You don't, certainly don't have to write any of this down. But if I was this Sunday preaching on John 1, 1 to 18, I think I would have in the back of my mind that we are about to begin to follow an eyewitness of Jesus. And you will have to think, or you will think of a way of introducing that in an engaging way. Uh, my, my old boss, uh, Dick Lucas, used to say, if there's an accident on the corner and uh, the police turn up and there's a big crowd the police will not say to the crowd, who saw what happened? Please go home. Who came late? 
I'm fascinated to know what you think. No sensible policeman would do that. Uh, and yet we live in a culture that's not interested in the eyewitnesses, but is interested in the people who've came come along later on. Do you understand the point of the illustration? Simple as it is, profound as it is. So we would want to help people to know that we're following an eyewitness and how valuable that is. Or we might want to help people see that God, the God of the Bible, turns the whole world right side up. And if your world is upside down, he is able to turn it right side up or something like that. Um, an illustration that comes to mind is that I remember going to speak to a girls' school near the church where I worked. And the girls' school, as almost all the schools today in the West, uh, is, was marked by telling the girls that they were the hope of the world and that they were the secret of the future and that they were the most wonderful people around and that the whole world was going to depend on them and they were going to reach the stars. Do you know this kind of school talk? And um, I remember being asked to speak at the carol service. And there we are in the context of the school, having been told for years, you will reach the stars. And the staff are there, and the parents are there. And we're singing the carols. He came down. He came down. And I remember it just dawning on me in the pulpit and saying to this large crowd of students, teachers and parents, you're going to have to make a decision. Because if you can reach the stars yourself, his coming down was a complete waste of time. But if you cannot reach the stars, his coming down is absolutely crucial. And so we're thinking of how to get people engaged in this issue. That's what I'm trying to point out to you. Here are my two headings, which uh, again, this may work or it may not work. Uh, the first, Jesus outweighs the world. And the second, Jesus invades the world. Now, now, please forgive me. I'm not pretending that you don't know how to do this. I'm just talking to you as a fellow soldier. This is one way that it could be done. And I know there are people in this room who could do this ten times better than I could do it. But I'm just suggesting to you one way of explaining this to people is that first he outweighs the world and second that he invades the world. What does it mean that he outweighs the world? Well, we're told here that he was around before creation. That's just a mind-boggling thought. <laughs> Can you picture Father, Son and Holy Spirit around, satisfied, engaged, totally okay and united, and there's no creation. It's a mind-boggling thought. And therefore, we, at Christmas, we'd want to say to people, wouldn't we, when you see the little manger scene in the shop window, that's not the beginning of Jesus. That's just his arrival. And then, of course, secondly, and these are just my points, he made creation because he's God and he's greater than the world. And therefore, if you have him, he outweighs the world. If you don't have him, but you've got the world, that's a tragedy. And then he's vital to creation. He's the light of the world. You are going to be in the dark without him. If you decide that climate change is the most important issue in the world, we say to the listeners, and you leave Jesus out of this, it's doomed to fail. Because the number one thing, relationship we need, is with him. And then some usefulness may flow from that into the world. But if you try and do the world and paradise without him, the maker, it's doomed to fail. Mm -hmm. So these are just simple things that are describing Jesus outweighing the world. And then the second thing is, he invades the world. And uh, interestingly, he gives good warning that he's coming. So the prophets announce him for centuries and then John the Baptist comes as the last prophet and points to him. And I think that's why Jesus in Luke 7 says that John the Baptist is the greatest of all the prophets, not because he was necessarily greater than Moses and um, Isaiah and Jeremiah, but because he had the privilege of pointing with his finger to the Messiah. And the, the, the greatness of John was his role, his privilege, 
But uh, here is uh, John the Baptist coming as part of this long line of predictions for Jesus' arrival. And then, of course, as he comes, well, you'd expect if the owner of the world comes into the world, everything will be wonderful, and he's dismissed and resisted and not welcome. And we need to feel the shock of that. And then, of course, there are those who do welcome him, and that's the wonder. It's a miracle, isn't it? The whole world is bicycling away from Jesus. And then suddenly, by the grace of God, some people are bicycling towards him. And then the third thing is he infinitely enriches the person who receives him. I mean, he enriches you beyond this world. It is actually true that if you get the Lord Jesus, you get more than the world. So these are just simple points about him invading the world. Somewhere in the whole of this, we would want to be telling people, wouldn't we, that the life that he brings, he paid for. We didn't deserve it. The grace that he brings is a gift and not a trophy. So we're helping people to get this in perspective. We're not forgetting the cross. But as we study this together, we're wanting people to say, this is the Christ, and by believing, I have life in his name. And then you might finish with an illustration you know, you might uh, take up the theme of grace, which is at the end of the prologue, and talk about how grace is more important than saying grace, or being poised, or the hymn Amazing Grace. But it's actually the gift of gifts. Um, I heard an illustration of Tim Keller's once, which I've never forgotten, and it always uh, makes an impact, I think, and it's a good sort of illustration to begin or finish a sermon. He said that he was once um, thinking small thoughts of Jesus Christ. Have you heard him talk about this before? And then he went on a retreat and he said the speaker said to the young kids on the retreat, uh, if you had to make a model of the galaxy in which you live, uh, how big a box would you need for the model? And he said the uh, scale of your model is going to be the, the distance from the earth to the sun is the thickness of a piece of paper. Okay, so this is the scale you're working on. Earth to sun, thickness of a piece of paper. How big a box do you need to make a model of the galaxy? And the answer is you need a box 700 kilometres by 700 kilometres by 500 kilometres to make a model of the galaxy. And the speaker went on to say, since the Lord Jesus has made, owns and sustains billions of galaxies, we don't get to put him into our back pocket. It's a great picture, isn't it? And it's something of what John is stressing here in this uh, section of the greatness of Jesus. Who is it who comes in? <laughs> Somebody who's behind the universe. How is it possible that you could take him, receive him? That's the gracious plan of God. If you have received him, is that like you've just changed your breakfast cereal? You've actually become infinitely and eternally rich. So these are things that we would work on together. Okay, so there's just some thoughts on how we might introduce, get people listening, break the passage up into two sections, continue to remember the grace of God, and uh, if possible, help people to see something of what John is about in chapter 20, verse 31. Okay, do you want to say anything about that? I really didn't uh, do that so you would say, well, that was great. That could have been very, very ordinary. But I just wanted you to hear somebody trying to get to grips with it in a way that's conveyable and perhaps even receivable. Quick uh, question. Yeah, Andrew. Um, you're starting off your uh, sermon series on the, on the book of John and you're wanting to preach the prologue. You want to give some context, maybe who the writer is, where this fits in scripture, how much do you do all that work in your first sermon as you're introducing this prologue? My answer to that, and you must tell me what you think, my answer to that is that we would want to introduce the series quite quickly, and then if possible, this is my policy, is put some bait on the hook. And I don't mean a great joke, or an emotional story. I just want them to get why this is really valuable. 
And so the bait might be the whole world thinks upside down because it's all impossible ladder. But this message is ladder down, grace down, which will revolutionize your life if you'll listen carefully. At that point, having got people listening, we might then say, of, in the New Testament, there are four accounts of Jesus, two by eyewitnesses, one Matthew, one John. And John, one of the disciples, probably wrote late. And you just jot down a couple of quick things, fast little sentences, because you don't want to really bore people with a lecture, but you do want them to come with you. And then you're down to your issues. That's what I would do. So this is what we're doing. A couple of sentences. Reason, come with me. Quick, as quick as possible, sketch of the background. And if you've got to do something on authorship, when John doesn't actually say, hi, I'm John, I wrote this book, you've just got to think of two sentences that will help people be confident, persuaded that it's John. Okay. is yeah it's a great question yeah um, well Bill there's a number of ways you could do that one is you could say uh, in again in a few sentences you may be interested to know that uh, there are three Gospels that kind of see with the same lens mm. but there's one that puts a different camera mm. onto the whole work um, and you know we should be very grateful that although the three uh, didn't say identical things that largely they were looking at the same you know, the same camera, and then in comes this extra camera. Um, I mean, there are lots of differences between the synoptics and John, not least the fact that somebody has pointed out that John's gospel probably covers 21 days, and therefore you just don't have the years that are being covered in the synoptic gospels. I mean, he's doing the span from arrival to... To death, but he's actually dealing with specific days. Yeah. I was curious if you could elaborate a little bit on, on the uh, notion of the, the term word um, being an Old Testament thing. Uh, and it resonates with me. I just, uh, if you give me a, uh, a little bit more thought on that, uh, direction on that, um, because Yeah, thank you. I think there was a time where people would say that John's Gospel was really wrestling with Gnostic issues and therefore it was of great interest, you know, this word, what's the key to life? And he's basically using a very clever term to get um, people interested in the later half of the first century. But I think people wisely have countered or balanced that by saying that John would be completely aware of Genesis and therefore there is no doubt that as he begins his Gospel He's wanting to draw very clear parallels with the beginning of the Bible. Um, and we even know from Mark's Gospel that when he says in the beginning, he's uh, actually announcing, this is a comment that is made by Edwards in his pillar commentary on Mark. He actually says that Mark dares to say something greater than Genesis 1-1 is happening. I mean, in the beginning, the world... But in the beginning, or the beginning, the beginning of the coming of Jesus, this outweighs Genesis. But I think John is probably just drawing a neat parallel, which is just reminding us that he's interested in the Jew and the Gentile. Okay? I will simply say two sentences and then stop. Uh, if that's okay. And the two sentences are that the second half of John chapter 1 seems to be very small bickies compared to 1, 1 to 18. 
But actually what's happening in the second half of John is that this person, Jesus, who's come down to earth is gathering people. And one of the reasons that he's gathering people is because John the Baptist has swung the spotlight over to Jesus and is not interested in having the spotlight on himself. So a lot of John 1, 19 to 51 is the shift from John the Baptist to Jesus and Jesus starting to collect people. Is that important? Of course it's important. So it's a strange thing when you're teaching the first chapter of John's Gospel that you're dealing with something that is so cosmic, mind-boggling, and then you come right down to earth with normality.